Well, thank you so much for coming out on a nice day. Everybody hear me okay? Um, I, uh, I, I'm truly honored to be here. I was so excited to get the invitation from Alex uh, a few months ago. And thank you for the very kind uh, uh, introduction, Alex. I appreciate that very much. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a topic that I'm you know, very passionate about. I think we're all kind of really passionate about biking, you know, sustainability, all that good stuff. Um, so this story kind of begins about nine and a half years ago in Cambodia. Uh, my brother and I went to Cambodia together. Uh, he's a doctor, pediatrician. I'm a filmmaker. And we'd gone on many long bike rides before. And we thought, well, this time, let's do something different. We wanted to bike across Cambodia. This time, let's give our bikes away at the end of the ride to a couple lucky kids. You know, kind of nice. So we found an orphanage in uh, uh, Phnom Penh. And three weeks before we left, we realized, wow, there's 88 kids at this orphanage. You know, it's two happy kids and 86 not happy kids. And we didn't want that to happen. So we launched a fundraiser. And within just a few days, we had all the money we needed to buy bikes for every kid. And then three weeks later, we got to the orphanage. The truck rolls up. And this is what happened. Here we are, moments before the moment of happy. Jared and I hanging out. The, the truck is two minutes away now or less. Hopefully they mean that. For those in light, <laughs> the kids are going crazy with anticipation, and it's time for the moment of happy to happen. So it was a pretty good scene. Uh, the kids were really happy. Uh, I think we can all remember our first bikes back in the day, right? And that, that feeling of jubilation you get when you, when you first get that bike and like, wow, I, I have freedom now. You know, I can go where I want, I can do what I want. It was this amazing, amazing moment. And I, I think the real takeaway there for us was that, you know, when you have folks in difficult circumstances, orphans, uh, human trafficking survivors, who've overcome so much, you have to do more than just provide for their sustenance, their food, their shelter, the water. You gotta give them something fun. And a bike is something fun and useful. It's the perfect vehicle of freedom and fun. And you give a bike to these folks in circumstances like this, and it does more than just make them happy. It gives them this, this sense of uplift and the sense where they can move forward in their lives, the sense of being able to go anywhere. Um, the next day, we uh, uh, got up early. Uh, we were gonna go back to the, uh, the orphanage. Uh, the orphanage driver picked us up, and he looked really tired. And we asked him why, and he said, well, this morning, long before the crack of dawn, uh, the orphanage staff was awakened by a symphony of little bike bells well. <laughs> as all of the kids, many of whom had gone to bed with their bikes, so much it meant to them, had gotten up to ride around. Uh, they were still riding when we got there, and we realized right then, if we hadn't before, that we really had to do this again. Uh, and so we did. We followed it up the next year with a 200 bike endowment to uh, former child soldiers in a refugee camp in northern Uganda. And these kids have been through just unspeakable uh, horrors. They've seen their lives fall apart from war and poverty. Uh, the bike gave them that sense of freedom again. It gave them that sense of freedom. It kept them safe, potentially helped them get a job, move forward in their lives. Most importantly, it showed that they were worth it. Despite all they'd been through, they were worth it. The year after that, we went to Peru. Uh, we endowed about 120 bikes to, to uh, uh, survivors of HIV-positive orphans in uh, the Montaro Valley. And uh, again, just, you know, this is an all-girls orphanage uh, in uh, the Montaro Valley. And you can just see the jubilation and the happiness, you, whether it's Cambodia, whether it's Peru, wherever it's right here, you get on a bike and, and you're happy. It moves you forward in your life. It gives you that happiness. The year after that, we, uh, we kind of began to expand. We uh, endowed bikes to uh, uh, former child slaves living in Ghana, India, Vietnam, and Nepal. Uh, this picture was taken on the shores of Lake Volta, the largest reservoir in the world. And uh, the recipient here was a former uh, child slave working for the fishermen uh, on, on the lake. And you can imagine when your freedom is taken away from you, and then it's given back, and then you get a bike on top of that, how that just exemplifies that sense of, of potential again. You know, you're, you're really free when you can head on down the road. There's no shackles that bind you anymore, and you can move forward. Uh, we, we buy the bikes locally from local vendors. We want to support the local economy. We uh, employ local labor local mechanics, we work with local NGOs, you know, people who've been working on the ground for a long time. They know their countries, they know their populations, they know the folks who really can benefit from a bike. Um, a few years ago, we, uh, we kind of shifted a little bit to focus mainly on women and girls, especially the heroic survivors of human trafficking and domestic violence. 
Uh, we felt like that was where you could make the biggest amount of difference. And uh, they, you know, they really use those bikes to move forward in their lives and overcome uh, a lot of the just horrendous things they've been through. Um, this is a picture was taken just a few months ago. So 10 years have passed now. And uh, like Alex mentioned, uh, we've now endowed over 5,000 bikes uh, to these heroic women and girls in 17 countries throughout the world. Thank you. Um, I hope a year from now we're at 10 and we just keep doing this. You know, we want to, you know, 5,000 is good, but there's so many people who need bikes. And they live in the, uh, the Himalaya, high up in the Himalaya. They live in these, these mega cities like Saigon, just pulsing with energy. They live along these little rivers in Mozambique, you know, just clustered uh, uh, along the Zambezi River. Uh, they live on the vast step prairies of Mongolia. Uh, they live everywhere in the world because everywhere in the world, the bike has that same sort of power to lift people up, to make us happy. It binds us together. It's this magical symbol no matter where you live. Um, we uh, we uh, start off the, uh, uh, what we call the moment of happy by giving each bike recipient a card. And on the front of the card is a picture of their donor. This is somebody you know, in the US or Europe who donated 88 bucks. That's our price point. Uh, using that money, we bought a bike in country and, and gave it to her. So there's a picture of that person on the front, and there's a world map on the back. And we can show them on the world map where their donor lives in the world and where the recipient lives in the world. And they love that. They love looking on the map and going, whoa, it is a long way from New Haven to Phnom Penh. You know, that, that's, that's a lot of distance. And it leverages the bike. It enhances the gift because it shows them there was somebody in the world, some specific person, who cared about them enough to give them a bike. You know, it didn't just fly out of the sky. There was actually somebody who clicked that button who wanted them to have this bike and submitted their photo, and they're now connected in this circuit of philanthropy. Um, so we ask them a lot of questions. We want to do a little interview and make them feel like they're really special. Like this is, you know, this is a special moment. Uh, uh, girls in the Philippines are really concerned about climate change. We hear concerns like that. Uh, you know, we ask them favorite foods. Uh, questions differ. Last question is always the same. What do you want to be when you grow up? And when you're working with folks who have been through so much, um, this question just causes them to look to the horizon, to dream. It just sparks something in them, in all of us, really, that uh, is, is I I incredibly inspiring. What do you want to be when you grow up? And through the course of, of doing this over the last uh, few years, we've heard thousands of responses to that question. You know, we've heard diplomat, we've heard president of the country, uh, we've, heard, uh, we've heard seamstress, uh, we've heard teacher. This is Francesca, she lives in a barangay, which is a neighborhood in Manila, uh, the most densely populated city in the world. And she wants to be a teacher when she grows up. She says that teachers help, help people, and that's what she wants to do. And the bike will help her, help her reach her dream. Uh, this is Sophia, and she lives in the exact opposite kind of place as Manila. This is a little, river, a little uh, village in uh, Mozambique along the, the Zambezi River called Capaceni. It took her, uh, she had to walk 15 miles with her little brother in tow to uh, reach the endowment site in kind of the center village there of Sena. Uh, she got the bike, of course, now she can ride home. She too wants to be a teacher. So no matter whether, whether you're in like the most densely populated city in the world, or you're way out in the middle of nowhere in Mozambique, you know, teacher is something that also kind of uh, binds people together. It's this, it's this uh, very aspirational uh, goal that a lot of these kids have. Um, we hear a lot of doctors. Uh, we hear a lot of lawyers, uh, nurses, things like that. Uh, those, those are always very popular. We also hear some really interesting professions. Uh, this is Elvira. She lives in uh, Belgrade, Serbia, and she wants to be a break dancer. Is there anybody here who wanted to be a break dancer when they were young, growing up? Yeah, I didn't think so. She wants to be a break dancer, so I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, this is uh, Marvuri. She lives in the uh, Montaro Valley of Peru, and she wants to be a poet. I thought that was kind of nice. She wants to be a poet. Bikes, you know, moving forward. Maybe the ideas. I always get ideas when I'm when I'm writing, something like that. And uh, this is this is Kimberly. She lives on the island of Palawan in the Philippines. And I tossed this one in here because you know this is a talk about biking and you know by association sustainability and all that good stuff. And she she wants to be a petroleum engineer. And we'd never heard this before. Not an electrical engineer, not a, you know, not a civil engineer. She wants to be a petroleum engineer. And I thought that was really funny and I asked her. Hello, I'm Kimberly Ann Gabriel. I'm 17 years old. My dream is to become a successful petroleum engineer. I like to be a petroleum engineer because 
Uh, I love to explore. I love math. I love it so much. That's it. <laughs> I'm just curious why you chose petroleum instead of a different kind of it. That's so interesting. No one's ever said that before. I don't like electrical engineering. I am afraid for electricity. So. <laughs> but you're not afraid of gas. I'm not afraid of gas. Because I love gasoline. Wow, you love gasoline. Yeah, I love gasoline too much. <laughs> Where in the world would you want to be a petroleum engineer? I would love to come to the country. Actually, in the US. Not in the US. Houston, maybe? Houston? Houston. Houston. I don't know what where's Houston. I'm just only curious for the gasoline, how they know that it is a, a roof, a, a gas, a state. I'm so very curious for that thing, so that's why I like literally engineering. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, I never heard that one before, never since. And I, I just had to toss it in again because it, it, I guess the whole moral is that, you know, whether you want to be a petroleum engineer or a cyclist or whatever, you know, the enthusiasm that goes with, uh, with that question is really amazing. And it's, it's, all, it's wonderful to see in example after example how a bike can get someone to become anything they want. This is Pooja. She lives in Kolkata, India. She's a uh, trafficking survivor. And she, when she received a bike from us, she got really emotional. And she said, because of this bike, I can now pursue my dream to be a boxer. <laughs> this is another one that I only heard a couple times, you know, once or twice, a boxer. Um, and yeah, this, for me, is kind of where the streams come together. You know, over here, you've got, you've got the, the work of giving bikes to these folks in difficult circumstances. And over here, you've got this vast reservoir of dreams and all the things they want to be, boxer and petroleum engineer and everything else. And when you bring those two things together, you know, dreams and bikes, that's when the magic happens. That's when the alchemy of you can go anywhere takes place. That's when a girl living in a slum uh, who has been through horrendous circumstances can really begin to dream that her goal to be a boxer can actually, can actually take place because she's got the passion. You know, she's got the, uh, the energy, she's got the talent, she's got the drive. What she doesn't have is much money or much time. You know, it's really hard to get from her place to her work uh, to the gym, to have you know, her boxing lessons. Uh, and and when, you, when you fight against all of these limitations, sometimes those dreams die. When you give her a bike, suddenly it opens everything up. Suddenly she can get across town, suddenly she can get to her boxing lessons, suddenly she can get to work, and you know, she can make it happen. You can do it in a healthy way. Um, we see this, um, this, 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 this pattern throughout the world where you've got this, these incredible dreams, but they're going untapped. You know, everything from diplomat to poet to everything. How do we tap those dreams? How do we allow those folks to, to really begin moving forward in what they can do in life? And the first step we found that works really well is simply give them a bike. Because a bike allows them to move forward, allows them to go forward, allows them to connect the dots. And it's not just what it does for us you know, physically in order to you know, get around town. It's, it's what it does for the soul, right? And I know I'm kind of speaking of the choir here. We're all kind of bike people where we have that affinity. But when you hop on a bike, you know, it just makes you happy. You know, it moves you forward in life physically and it moves you forward spiritually. You know, when you're looking down the road, when you're giving, riding a bike and, and you see the open road unfold before you, the, the possibilities just open up. You know, limitations begin to fall and you can suddenly really begin to dream. You can suddenly think, wow, I can actually do that. I can actually achieve my goal of being a boxer or whatever that dream might be. So going back to Pooja, she has turned what was once a, a negative you know, transporting across town and trying to, you know, get to everything she's got to do into a positive. Suddenly it's something fun, it's something uplifting, it's something that, that, that gives her lift in her life, that inspires her. It's just like when we bike commute, you know, when you're on your bike versus in the car, you get to work, you get to the grocery store, wherever, you're ready to go, you're ready for the day, you, you've, you've had this upsurge of energy and, uh, and it's turned something that was drudgery into something that's fun, something that's uplifting. And I, I think that's, uh, you know, it's, 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 it, you, you see that wherever you are in the world. The bike has that ability to transform that uh, ritual into something positive. Um, so bikes do all that stuff. They're kind of, they're kind of magical. We all know that. Uh, but I think the most important thing they can do is give life to our dreams. Um, this is uh, Ulapar. She lives in Savannah, Ket, Laos. And she received a bike from us uh, three years ago. And she told me when, for her dream gig, she wants to own her own salon. Uh, now, you know, brick and mortar store, all the, you know, the capital to get that going is, is kind of a tough, a tough ask. So she's gonna use the bike to make, uh, use the bike to, to create a mobile beautician business. Well, she'll travel from place to place and do treatments 
at all the folks in the countryside. Savannah Kent's pretty rural. There's not, not a whole lot of city down there. So she's going to travel from home to home and do these, uh, these, uh, these, these treatments. Terrific use of the bike and terrific way to kind of make her dreams happen. Entrepreneur, by the way, is the fourth most popular choice of folks around the world. You know, whether it's uh, Ulipar who wants to uh, start her own uh, salon or someone who may want to start a grocery business or something like that. Or even, uh, this is one of my favorites, even Sok, uh, nine years old. She received a bike from us in March. Lives in the red light district of Cambodia in Phnom Penh. And she wants to own a mine. <laughs> she wants to own a mine. Um, why does she want to own a mine? She doesn't care if it's copper, silver, gold. She doesn't care. She just wants to own a mine. And the reason why is because if she owned a mine, she told me, she would have a consistent source of revenue. <laughs> and she'd never have to worry about it. She'd always have, you know, something, uh, she'd always have some money coming in. So, you know, whether it's a mine in Presario or whatever, whatever, whatever you want to be in life, a bike can help you get there. Uh, one of the questions we always get is follow-up. You know, like, how can you actually tell how a bike impacts somebody longitudinally? Can, can you tell? You know, and, and I always kind of, I hear this question, I'm like, well, well, isn't it obvious? I mean, this is, this is from the Mekong River Delta in Vietnam, and, and look how happy they are. Isn't it just obvious, you know, the power of a bike? Do we, you know, I mean, I don't know. It, it's like this, uh, this sign I saw in Tokyo at this park, you know, it's, how do you use this cycle track? We just enjoy it, you know, it's, it's obvious, you know. Bumper sticker outside of Cape Town. I mean, who doesn't, right? It's obvious. You know? But uh, unless you're, you know, for those of us who haven't uh, drunk the, the biking Kool-Aid, um, I don't know, anybody participate in the Naked Solstice bike ride in Fremont and Seattle? I missed that one. You missed that one? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. it's a good time, it's a good time. <laughs> those of us who have not done this, and I haven't actually, have not drunk the Kool-Aid, can you actually look back uh, forward, can you see how the bike, in, uh, you know, that, that receiving that bike actually impacts someone's life from the moment they get it? And the answer is yes, of course, or at least we're gonna try really hard to, uh, to show that. Um, this is Elma. She's uh, a trafficking uh, survivor who lives in uh, Serbia. And she received a bike from us in 2013. Um, she was slated to marry a much older man against her will. Instead, she eloped with her boyfriend. That was great. Totally a fan of, of the great love story. The problem is that they, uh, what, what are they going to do now? You know, the families disown them. She's 16, he's 17. You know, what are they going to do? Well, I followed back up with our partners a few months later and said, How, how's Elma doing? I really liked her and I wanted to see if she was doing okay. And they said, well, she's doing great. She started renting that bike out to everyone in her neighborhood and was charging like a buck a day, something like that. And her husband was acting as a mechanic. And she had basically started our first 88 bikes entrepreneurial bike share program. Um, I said, well, that's, that's terrific. You know, can we help out? Can we actually buy her a couple more bikes? And they said, no, she doesn't need it. You know, she's already used the money to buy more bikes. So she took the gift of one bike and she leveraged that into her own business. And I, 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 I love that story, just taking one bike and making a business out of it. Uh, she told us that she wanted to be a jewelry designer, it's her dream job. But I, I think she's probably shifted over to, uh, to entrepreneur like, you know, like thousands of other girls around the world as well. Uh, this is Seika. She also lives in Belgrade, Serbia, and received a bike from us. She was a trafficking survivor. She was trafficked to a uh, brothel in Kosovo and uh, was liberated. And, and we, when we followed back up with the, our partners after she received a bike, they told us that she had told them that this was the first time since being liberated from her uh, captors that she had felt like she was worth it, that she felt like she was beautiful again, happy again. It was just an amazing reaffirmation of what a bike can do for somebody. Um, she uses the bike to get to her uh, singing lessons, uses it to get to work, and it's you know, made this, this massive impact in her life. My favorite follow-up story of all, though, comes from Cambodia. This is Anne Sokrun. Uh, she uh, was the uh, survivor of a vicious gang rape a few years ago. She had a child from the assault. She uh, rehabilitated in our partner's ashram for a few months and then reintegrated to her home village on this island in the Mekong River. And uh, I really liked her. She had so much energy and so much passion, and she was so excited to get a bike. And so two years pass after she gets her bike, and we go back and visit her kind of to see how she's doing, uh, to see if the bike has had that impact. And the first thing I noticed when we walked into her home was that the donor card we'd given her two years before, this is our donor, Richard Sherman. He lives in Los Angeles. That donor card was placed in this place of honor next to her wedding photos in her house. It had meant so much to her to get that bike and to be connected with somebody that she had kept that card for two years and had placed it in that place of honor right next to her wedding photos. Um, she was thriving. 
She was doing great. They were expecting her second child. She was married. Uh, she had a thriving sewing business. Uh, she told me she gets up at three sometimes, goes to bed at midnight to keep up demand, and she still had her bike. Just amazing to see the impact. Uh, and there, there's the card uh, in, the, in the place of honor, right below her wedding photos. So bikes can do a lot, but can they, what, what can they do with like the big problems? You know? I mean, we were beset these days with these massive problems, you know, war, you know, countries being torn apart, uh, folks fleeing their country. What, what, can, what can bikes do with that, with the big, huge, intractable problems? Can they actually have an impact with those yes. problems? Yes, I, I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, we, did a, uh, we did a project a few years ago in, in the Philippines that, uh, to, to, to really start going after some of these big problems. In the Philippines, you have rebel factions that have been fighting against the government for years. And most of these folks want what most marginalized people around the world want. They want a greater say. They want uh, access to resources. They want jobs. They want a better life for their children. When the rebels lay down their arms, they're often viewed as pariahs in their communities. And even worse, their children are shunned. They're viewed as pariahs. And so the vulnerabilities vastly increase, and the girls especially become, uh, become the target of traffickers. Uh, so what can you do? What can be done to stop this cycle and, and, and address some of these, these, these deep, deep problems? Well, we, we gathered up about 100 of these, these, uh, these daughters of the former rebel soldiers. The military went deep into the jungle, uh, gathered them up in their, their Humvees, and we brought them all to Dumaguete, this uh, coastal town in the Philippines. And the military, these high-ranking uh, lieutenants and colonels in the, in the Philippine military, helped the girls learn how to ride bikes. These are the former enemies. You know, just a few months ago, they were shooting at each other, and now they're riding bikes together. It was the most amazing scene, and in some cases, you know, these, many of the teenage girls themselves were actually on the front line. So, in many cases, the, the, actually the enemy herself is now learning how to ride a bike with these, with these military commanders. It was just an incredible scene. So, it, you know, I watched this unfold, and uh, you, you can really see the power of something like a bike and bringing people together and taking care of some of these, uh, these deep problems, these deep-rooted uh, uh, concerns that, that folks have. Uh, it, was just, it was just beautiful. Um, my uh, uh, favorite story, though, from from bikes being, in, being able to impact folks' lives. Uh, it takes place a few years before the Cambodia trip, though. And I think that, uh, as many of us who've done long distance biking journeys would probably concur, if you want to get the greatest possible impact out of a bike, you've got to use it to go on a long journey, a journey that transforms you, a journey that can, uh, you know, that really uh, takes your life from where it was uh, to, a, to a very different place, a journey from which you return a different person than the one who left. And for me, this came uh, 19 years ago this summer when my brother Jared and uh, my best friend and I biked across America. Uh, different world back then, uh, no blogs, really any cell phones, no social media. Uh, we got lost a few times and we just had to ask directions. It was, it was kind of wild. Uh, no GPS, nothing like that. You're really lost to the road. It was a magical, magical time. Uh, we started off in Los Angeles, uh, played some uh, basketball in Venice Beach courts, struck off across the country, and ended up just kind of up the road from you guys in Springfield, Massachusetts. And the reason why has to do with why we towed this trailer behind our bikes. This is the Ark of the Covenant, uh, so we named it, uh, for the sacred cargo that was stored inside. I mean, like half-eaten jars of peanut butter and you know, a uh, camp stove and all kinds of pasta. We had this thing called True Fan Sludge that we made going across America. Uh, pasta, soup packets, you boil it down. In the morning, you have sludge cake, a little ketchup. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> 10 bucks a day, that's what you get. <laughs> but also in the Ark of the Covenant were two basketballs, one ball to play with, and one ball we had folks across America sign. And these were the people that helped us out. These are the folks that showed us where to go, that uh, brought us over for the night, that uh, bought us lunch, uh, things like that. It, it was uh, a ball bearing the imprint of humanity, the way we looked at it. And the idea was that we would present this ball to the powers that be at the Basketball Hall of Fame as kind of a token of America. So that was kind of our mission, to sort of see the best in our country, to gather these signatures of heroic people across America and then present this ball to the Basketball Hall of Fame at the end of the journey, 100 days and a whole summer later. Uh, so we struck off across uh, uh, the Mojave Desert. As you probably notice in the pictures, we're riding mountain bikes. Has anybody biked across America on a mountain bike? It's slow, very slow, but you don't get as many flats, so there's, there's some benefits. And we could hit the dirt roads and the trails. 
Uh, went up to the top of the San Bernardino Mountains, uh, hit Route 66. Back in the day, Roy's Cafe was the only place you'd get a cold drink for about 100 miles. Uh, so you'd get there at the Roy's Cafe and you'd chill out through the afternoon and then you'd keep going. You got another 50, 60 miles before you get to anything. Uh, it was magical. You're riding through these desert nights with the stars just hanging there. It was just, it was just magical. It's hard. It was magical. We get to Colorado. We pushed our bikes at the top of these, these, uh, these epic passes. This is a 12,800 foot engineer pass. Uh, we pushed the bike all day long. I think we did nine miles that day. Just, you know, an amazing time. You, you know, you don't, you don't shower. I think we went like a month without showering. So it's waterfalls, it's rivers, it's lakes, it's all that good stuff. Uh, tornadoes, we survived a tornado in Nebraska. Uh, this is us the, the, the day after all the stuff thrown out on the, uh, the jungle gym uh, to dry off. Uh, Mississippi River, you get to the Mississippi and it's very meditative, thinking about the water from you know, both sides of the country flowing down to the Mississippi, then out to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, Illinois, weaving in and out of the dashes on the road. And we camped everywhere. Uh, this is Route 66 back in California. Sometimes that's what you got. You got a side of the road. We did that. Uh, we camped out on the tops of the mountains. We camped on the Boston Common, not far from you guys. We had a, had a great night in the Boston Common. There's a bunch of folks real late coming through, making a lot of noise. We thought, oh, great, you know, we're going to have some trouble. And they said, shh, the bikers are trying to sleep. Nice. And they kept walking, so it was really cool. And we saw that across America, you know, it was what you'd expect, but then it wasn't what you expect. It was really neat. Uh, side of the road in Colorado, we camped at a drive-in movie theater in Nebraska. We rolled in, watched the movie, scored some free popcorn uh, from the projectionist, and we just rolled out the sleeping bags and camped for the night. Parks are really good. We camped at a lot of parks, uh, churches, a graveyard or two, golf courses. Uh, the beach, the Jersey Shore, we spent a couple nights there. As anybody who's done a bike journey like this knows, you, you kind of end up where you end up. You're tired and then you, you just camp there. And unless the cops kick you out, you stick around. Uh, and we had, we had the greatest time. We had the, the time of our life. Um, of course, every day isn't just joyful and happy, as anyone who's done a long distance bike ride will tell you. The days like this. <laughs> You guys doing all right? Flint, you all right there? You don't know? We've been soaked for a week. It hasn't stopped raining for a week. <laughs> Two weeks. <laughs> Two weeks. It may not be raining right now, but just wait 20 minutes. It'll be pouring again. Man, I'm sick of biking. I'm gonna throw my bike in the Atlantic Ocean. We're doomed. Get up! <laughs> Get up! <laughs> Here it comes again, Clint. I know. <laughs> I've known that for a long time. <laughs> you excited for the rain? It's gonna keep coming. It's not gonna stop. <laughs> it's never gonna stop. Never. <laughs> Welcome to West Virginia. We're glad to have you. Down the South River, you'll be able to see the house up there. It's a, it's a two story white house, and we just crash there. You'll like it. Great big house. So just come on, guys. All right. <laughs> see you in a little bit. We gratefully accepted John Buckins' offer of hospitality and met him over at his place. Guys, you got to get in the hot tub. I know you're tired, you're weary. Got a brand new hot tub. We were in it for the first time last night, so you got to break it in a little better tonight. <laughs> Four jets, two in the back of your neck, and two coming down on your shoulders. This, this will really fix you up for tonight. I want to be a rock star and travel really far and buy me a big expensive car and make lots of money and find me a honey and live in a nice big house where it's sunny with the pool. So that happened once in a while. You know, you get through the, the trials and somebody will be there to help you out at the end of the, at the, end of the trial. Uh, if, if you can get through them all, if you can get over the mountain passes, you know, the desert, mosquitoes, humidity, rainstorms, all that stuff, eventually, you end up at the place that all cross-country pilgrims long to see, and that's the ocean. And uh, I, I think for most of us who biked across America or biked a long distance, this is really the destination. This is when you get really excited about finally making it to the opposite coast. Well, we'll just we'll skip that one. Uh, it, we we uh, seen a jubilation, uh, get to the ocean, drop the bikes, run up to the ocean, jump in, seen a jubilation, Zeus. Um, and really funny line from my brother afterwards. Anyway, after we got to the ocean, we camped out on the beach for a couple days. 
we, uh, uh, we biked up the coast and we arrived at uh, Perth Amboy, New Jersey, right where the outer bridge dumps into Staten Island. And the plan was to, uh, to bike across the outer bridge. Has anybody ever taken the outer bridge here? Probably some folks have. Um, this is actually the Brooklyn Bridge. I didn't have a picture of the outer bridge, but you get the idea. There's no bike lane. There's just these walls of cement. And once you get onto the bridge, you know, no, nobody bikes it. You're, you're dead. Uh, you, know, you know, the cars are screaming by. There's just no place to go. There's no light. It, you, you're dead. Um, we, we got to the outer bridge and had to get across to get to Staten Island, to take the Staten Island Ferry to get to Manhattan. Because back in Colorado, when we were going over Engineer Pass, we came up with the idea for a Cologne line. <laughs> we thought when we get to New York, we're going to pitch this Cologne line to Calvin Klein. That was our, that was our plan. <laughs> when you're on a bike ride, as we've kind of seen already, when you get on a bike, you know, the limitations fall, possibilities go up, you know, and it's, it's you know, you can do anything. So our Cologne was summit Cologne, make your pass. Get it? Oh. Thank you. Uh, we thought it was sort of clever. Again, you know, you just, you're on a bike. It's a different kind of frame of reference here. And so, so we thought, okay, when we get to New York, we're going to pitch this, this, this Cologne line to Calvin Klein. The only problem is when we got to the Outer Bridge, we realized we could not go any further. You know, the Outer Bridge, you do not bike on the Outer Bridge. The problem was we were already out of money. We'd been on the road for three months. In order to get to New York on time, we had to get across this bridge. If we had to go up and around, we wouldn't have time. We'd have to skip it. And Summit Cologne would not come to the world. We didn't want that to happen. The world needed Summit Cologne. So we, uh, we approached a couple of cops uh, standing nearby, and we said, well, here's the deal. We're biking across America, you know, and it's been great. And it's been amazing, and we have to get to New York to pitch our cologne line. <laughs> Can you give us a police escort? And the cops, these are Jersey cops, you know, they, they're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can't do that. They were, they were laughing a little bit, yeah. Uh, probably laughing more inside, I would imagine that. So probably laughing a lot inside. And we, we explained it again. It's like, look, you know, across America, people have helped us out. You know, across America, we've had this amazing trip. And I know it sounds sort of silly, but, but we, we, we really want, this is, this is a big moment for us. We came up with this two months ago in Colorado. We got to pitch this Cologne line. And the cops said, okay, we'll confirm. So they stepped away for a couple minutes. They chatted. And then they came back, and Officer Serbo said, I'm really sorry, but we cannot give you a police escort across the outer bridge. It's just strictly against code. However, said Officer Lee, if we were to find you on the bridge in, say, two minutes, it would be in our best interest to get you to the other side as quickly as possible. So we wheeled onto that bridge. The cars formed around us. Horns are blaring. Lights are going everywhere. We're like, oh, crap. What if they were kidding? <laughs> <laughs> what, if, what if they got under the call and they had to go actually attend to something of any sort of importance, you know, as like a murder or something? But, but no, no, you know, two minutes in, car in the front, car in the back, lights flashing. Officer Cerebo in this faux tough guy voice is like, just stay in your lane and keep pedaling. And we pedaled like crazy across that thing. We never pedaled so hard. Uh, and that's how three pilgrims got a police escort into New York City. We ended up going to Calvin Klein. We ended up sneaking up the freight elevator. Um, it's, uh, you, you can see it in the documentary if you want, but uh, it, was, it, was, it was really fun too. Again, the whole idea being that if you, if, 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 when you're on that bike, you're on that journey, you know, anything is possible, even something sort of whimsical, like pitching a cologne line to Calvin Klein. So when I see a girl get a bike for the first time. I'm reminded of that same feeling of possibility I felt when we were going across the Outer Bridge or Nebraska or wherever it was, that feeling of anything being possible, of you can go anywhere. And I want everyone to feel that way. You know, I, I, I think it's so important that, that you just, that folks get that little nudge that they can do anything. We got right up to the executive offices of Calvin Klein. You know, we talked to their personal assistant. We, we were in chat with in, in contact with them for a while. It really, be, it really happened. And it wouldn't have happened if we hadn't had that feeling of, po of possibility and potential that the bike gives you. Uh, this is a clip um, that was uh, taken. Okay. Let's see if it's going to roll here. Um, well, anyway, this is a clip from uh, about three years ago, or uh, three months ago, in Cambodia. Uh, we, uh, I wanted to show you the process of delivering a bike to somebody. Um, sometimes it's easy, you know, they're, they're right there in town. Sometimes it's, it's much more difficult. Uh, in this case, we buy the bike in, in Phnom Penh from a distributor. Uh, in this case, it's uh, these kind of gently used Japanese bikes. And we load it on the top of an SUV. The SUV heads up the river. We hire a skiff. Uh, we take the skiff for about an hour and a half up the river uh, until we reach this, this, uh, this kind of nondescript uh, landing site. Uh, 
Shrey Mom, the recipient and her family are waiting for us there. We unload the bike. Shrey Mom's dad brings the bike up to their stilt house, and the moment of happy ensues. Um, it took us about a day. It was a good day to get up there. You know, several hours of, of, of it's okay, it's no big deal. Several hours of bike, of, of, of uh, driving in the SUV, about an hour and a half in the skiff. There's a great shot of us swimming off a sandbar in the Mekong River, so, but sorry, I'm gonna miss that. Um, and I, I, you know, we, we've had folks push back a little bit to say, well, that's a long way to go for one person. I mean, you're delivering a bike to one person, that's, that's a long way to go. But it's also, in my, my estimation, a very short way to go because it's a bike. You know, it's that magical vessel of freedom and fun. It's that thing that allows people to begin to dream again. So, of course, we're going to go up the river, you know, drive, you know, the Mekong, hire the skip, the whole shebang, because a bike has that power to make the impossible possible. I mean, what if Seika back in Belgrade has never gotten her bike? She wouldn't have that feeling of, of things being okay again, of being returned to this feeling of, of beauty and happiness and, and potential. She wouldn't be able to get to her singing lessons or, or, or back in India. You know, Pooja, would she be able to get to her boxing lessons without that bike? Probably not. I mean, that dream dies. Um, this is Adambatar in Mongolia. We did a project in Mongolia. She got a bike. What, what happens if she doesn't get a bike? You know, uh, what happens if the girls in the Philippines don't get bikes? You know, I mean, can they, uh, do, they, do they reintegrate to their community? Do they have that same sense of healing and possibility? What if I never got a bike? You know, what if none of us got bikes? You know? I mean, would we have biked across America? Would 88 bikes have happened? Would I be talking to you? Probably not. So a bike has that power to lift people up, to move them forward, and to connect them with their dreams, no matter where they live in the world. You know, whether you're Trey Mom living in Cambodia, or me living here, or any of us living wherever we live, you know, the bike has that power to, to give voice to our dreams. Uh, I've been asked sometimes, can bikes change the world? And, and the answer is usually, well, not in and of themselves, but the feeling you get when you throw your leg over the saddle and you head off down the road, that feeling, that feeling can change the world, and that, that feeling is kind of what we're going for here. Um, so all of this kind of has to do with, with our core philosophy, and that is joy-based philanthropy. The idea being that happiness, life fulfillment is a human need, and we have, to, we, have to, uh, we have to work with folks to achieve that just as we work for them to have sustenance and food, shelter, water. It's not enough just to provide a shelter. You, you, you've got to provide for people's happiness as well. We've got to allow them to move forward in their lives. Um, Otherwise, they won't. Otherwise, that great reservoir of dreams just goes untapped. Otherwise, folks never have the possibility of becoming a boxer or a teacher or a diplomat or whatever they want to do in life. And thankfully, a bike is something that can bring us there. And I, I believe that if, if we can move forward as a, kind of a, as a world community and, and see that potential in each other and work to allow us all to have that potential and to reach that potential, sometimes through something like a bike, but heck, it could be a surfboard. We do a dressmaking workshop as well. Bikes tend to be pretty darn good. I think that we don't have any limitations. That as a society, we have no limitations. That while the girls can go anywhere, you can go anywhere. There's a society, we can go anywhere. Thank you.